and share with us. I'll just tell you this. I, I've known Brother Cunningham now. Um, I met him in mid-90s, maybe. Mid to late 90s. Early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, we were both young and handsome. <laughs> Now we're just handsome. <laughs> um, I like that. I like that. But he's a he's a he's a good man. He's a godly man, and he has a lot to share with us. He and his wife. I um, we're just gonna just welcome uh, Dr. Andrew as he comes. And shares. Well, I, I like what Pastor Mark had to say. <laughs> Only it didn't really apply to me, but. <laughs> but Last time I was here, it's been a few years ago. I think he looks younger today than he did then. Yes, he does, he does. And his beautiful wife, Carol. No, I don't, I don't want the glasses, thank you. And uh, you look good. You look good. And uh, we didn't get here on our looks, did we? There was a, a missionary uh, that I like, Charles Greenaway, he used to say, if we're gonna get there, we're not gonna look like much. I, I think that's a good way to put it. It's not about how we look, except in the past, in past remarks. This church has been with me longer than any other church in New England. You may not have known that, Pastor Mark. You can give yourself a hand. I wanna say thank you, that's really why I'm here. If I don't say anything else, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness praying for us. Thank you for your faithfulness giving to the ministry. Never miss a month, every month, right? Just, just faithful as can be supporting our ministry at Yale for about 30 years. For about 30 years. And when I first came here, I was not even a, a missionary to Yale, if you can believe that. I was still a missionary to Belgium. But uh, God was in the process of changing my marching orders. And uh, I, I was here, uh, Pastor Fegler welcomed me here. We stayed at the house with the Feglers. And he talked to me about something that I thought, what is he talking to me about? He was talking to me about a, a fledgling ministry that was just starting up at Yale University. It had been only going on for about a year. And how they were having a, an outreach to international students, started by C. Alpha Johnson from Liberia and, and a few other uh, Christians here in the greater New Haven area. And uh, he was talking to me about it. But he didn't know <clears throat> that on my heart, I was praying, God, what is next for me? <clears throat> Excuse me. Because uh, when we came, came home on furlough from Belgium, My, my younger daughter, Shannon, was having a bout of, with something called anorexia. And to make, some of you are shaking your head, yes. I've been through it with my daughter. I'm still shaking my head, no, I don't understand it. But I do know this, if God got her through it. That's, that's the important thing. But at that moment in time, she wasn't healthy enough to go back overseas. And we knew it. And so we were wondering, well, where are we gonna go? What's gonna happen? So Pastor Fegler began talking to me about this ministry, yeah, and maybe it's because I have a little DR before my name. I really don't understand it. Because I, I, Yale didn't really, really mean a lot to me. You know, I was a missionary in Africa, missionary in Belgium, Yale University, but, and I didn't, is there a ministry at Yale? Turns out there is. There wasn't much. There was a huge need for ministry. And then I talked to another pastor over in Norwalk, and Pastor Mariano, I'm sure you know him, and, and he began to talk to me about the, this ministry at Yale and the need at Yale. He took me on campus. And before I, I came, I was a Southern California missionary, but I came for the fall tour. I was invited by some churches. This is one of the first churches I preached at in the fall, 1993, 2023. It was, it was right now, this is like the 30th anniversary of when I was here. And before I left New England, God had begun talking to me about going to Yale. It was a surprise to me. It was a shock. I, I really wasn't eager to do it. I thought, I don't know what that means. But anyway, long story short, I, I went to Yale. The district officials, they said, we've been praying for years that God would send us somebody to go into the Yale campus and do ministry. 
And that's, that was us. That was us. And this church was part of that story. So you're part of my story. And I'm part of your story too because I've been here a long time and because many of you have participated in our ministry over the years at Yale. Many of you brought dinners. We had for welcome dinners for our Alpha course and all. Delicious food. I've got videos. i got uh, slides, everything of you guys on, on the campus and at the Alpha course. How many of you remember? Some of you remember. Just raise your hand, those of you. Yeah, quite a few. Quite a few remember. And so thank you for that. Thank you for that. Somehow between the Daffodil Festival and everything else, you found time to come and, and uh, come and minister at Yale University. And uh, so I, I won't tell, I take a lot of, the Lord put a message on my heart for this morning. So I won't take a lot of time just to talk about the ministry. But I, I've told you in the past that we, we've seen uh, among those that are from the People's Republic of China, Ch Communist China, that we have, have seen more than 250 that we've saved, most of them, many of them we've baptized, Lighthouse Point, so we've, we've seen, we've had more and more through the years. I, this is a while back, I, I used to say 250 now, I don't, I've kind of lost count. But let me just read you a little letter I got recently from uh, Hong Mei. Hong Mei is a Chinese young woman that, that was uh, doing a, a postdoc at Yale. She said, I became a Christian in your Alpha course while I was at Yale. I received God's mercy and salvation. Now I've been back in Beijing and I preach the gospel to the Chinese where I'm a professor. My church is facing government persecution. But anyhow, brothers and sisters are still ardent in spirit and serving the Lord. Please pray for us. One of the believers who was a professor was sacked. Sacked. Lost her job. Because we baptized 24 new believers. Hallelujah. 24 new believers. He it. So it really is missions in reverse. Mm -hmm. They come here. We send them back as missionaries. Mm -hmm. We send them back to their own country. They speak the language. They understand the culture. They're already academics in an academic setting. And they're able to, to reach their own people. So I don't know how many exactly. Uh, the Chinese, many other countries, of course, it's not just Chinese. But uh, in many other countries. But we have, I'm sure, our harvest back in the, in the, on the harvest field is greater, maybe a thousand times greater even, than it is here on the Yale campus as, as these wonderful young men and women, they go back, they're influential people. With their diploma from Yale University, they go right to the top in the business and government, military, everything, you name it. They're influential people and they're able to share Jesus Hallelujah. with their own country, yes. with their own uh, brothers and sisters and colleagues. So we thank you for that. And I know that we're on TV, so I'm not going to go in a lot, but we have a lot of going on in Yale, as it's going on at a lot of universities. I'll just say this. Pray for the special difficulties that are, that are undergone by some of our Asian students. Because there are people on the campus who are assigned to send reports back home to their countries. To let... They're, they're watching them. They're watching them. A lot of them that come to, in, in our ministry, at least 30%, are members of the Communist Party. That doesn't stop from getting saved. But it makes it a little bit more difficult for them to come to our events knowing that somebody back home is getting a report about it. But anyway, just, that's just one of the challenges we face. And, and just the liberal nature of an Ivy League campus. You know, we, we know what, who we believe. The Bible says, I know whom I have believed, right? That's not popular in academic circles. So pray for us. You know, God has given us favor. God has given us an open door. I believe an open door that no man can shut. There have been people that tried to shut the door, believe me. But God has kept the door open, and, and we're seeing hard. So thank you for being part of that. Uh, I was going to just share one more thing with you. Some of you came to the Alpha Course. Alpha Course is a, a, an evangelistic thing we do on Friday nights. And uh, I just, just to give you an idea of the kind of people that come, these are 10 of our guests that came. And there were a few others, but I didn't get to them. We had two neurologists, one psychologist, two OBGYNs, 
two other medical students, one nephrologist, I don't know what a nephrologist does, one sociologist, another physician doing postdoc research. That's the kind of people that come to our meetings. But they're just like me and you. A lot of them are lonely. A lot of them find it difficult living in a foreign country. They need Jesus. Amen. Thank you yes. for helping us to reach them with the truth of the gospel. Well, today is your Faith Promise Sunday. And you may have already got your uh, Faith Promise thing all filled out or whatever. But I'd like to just share with you. I've been doing missions conventions. I've actually been a missionary since 1980, so a long time. And every time I do, I have this sense. I don't know if you can feel it like I feel it. But I have this sense that what we're doing here is a lot bigger than what, what we might realize. We look around, we see the faces on the, uh, of the, the foreign faces from the many countries all over the world. And that helps us understand just a little bit. But it's hard for us to really realize that a missions convention, this mission convention, today, right here, right where we are, is touching the world. It's changing the world. It's redeeming the world. And the light of the gospel is going forth because of what you're doing. You say, well, I'm just going to write down, I'm just going to give, I can only give so much of Realize that what you're giving to is, is an endeavor that's rocking and changing this world. Uh, I uh, went on the, the website of the Assemblies of God. I looked at their homepage. And on their homepage, you can find it anytime you look. It talks a little bit, just kind of a little thumbnail sketch about the Assemblies of God. And it has some astounding, astounding statistics. Let me just read one short paragraph. It says, the Assemblies of God was founded in 1914. Today there are close to 13,000 churches in the U.S. with nearly 3 million members and adherents. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a good growing church. But the, listen to this. There are 85,393,883 Assemblies of God adherents worldwide. So did you catch that? 3 million in the United States, worldwide 85 million. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's since 1914, the first missionaries went out, just handfuls. Today, we have about 3,000 missionaries, 3,000 people. Think of the ratio. Think of that. Think of how many these 3,000 people have won. Well, we give credit to the Holy Spirit, but don't we? It's not by might nor by power, but how? That's right. It's God's spirit. So God is at work. But he uses missionaries. And he uses churches that give to missionaries. And, and so um, in the USA, like I say, we have 3 million. Overseas, there are 85 million. In the United States, we have 13,000 churches. Around the world, 350,000 churches. Think of the difference. 13,000 here, 350,000 around the world. Less than 5% of the giving in the Assemblies of God goes to foreign missions. Think how your dollars count. Yes. Your nickels, dimes, and quarters. Think how it's counted. It, it is an investment in eternity. I'm not saying don't support the local church. I'm not saying that at all. If it wasn't for the local church, how would I be supported, right? Mm -hmm. That's essential. But the fact is, the small amount that goes to missions works very hard. Works very hard. Uh, in the Assemblies of God, there's a new soul born every, born into the kingdom every 16 seconds. Praise God. A new church planted every 42 minutes. A new minister completes his or her education every 45 minutes. So friends, we are partnering with God. Yes. You are partnering with me. Mm -hmm. You're part of my team. Amen. I just want you to know you're an indispensable part of my team. You're an important part. Thank you for being part of my team. Thank you for holding us up. Thank you for holding those doors wide open so that we have access. We can walk on that campus with our heads held high. We have a good, good name because we love students. We love them. And we have a, a ministry is like a family. Like a family. A lot of lonely, uh, lonely students, but they find a family. So it's kind of like your missionary church, your satellite church on the campus at Yale. And I'm kind of like your satellite pastor. So thank you for allowing me that privilege. 
So today I'm going to bring a message about the calls of God. Calls, plural, C-A-L-L-S, calls of God. I've been uh, feeling a little bit nostalgic since I got that phone call from, from uh, my, my friend John and thinking about coming back here to Meriden and looking forward to seeing you again. And uh, began thinking about looking back on the ministry. And I was talking to, to Pastor Mark earlier. He was telling me about his own testimony, how, how he got saved in the, what was it? St. Paul's Episcopal Church. St. Paul's Episcopal Church, yeah. And God calls people. Yes. God calls people. Yes, he does. Amen. He called people and he's still calling people. I, I was a, a volunteer youth pastor back in 1972 while I was still a college student. Credential was 75, appointed as a missionary in the 1980s. I've been doing this a while. And I was meditating on what it means to be called by God. And I was also meditating on what a blessing it is to be called by God. Mm -hmm. A blessing that I didn't have to make any decisions. God made them all for me. God made them all for me. I'm not kidding when I say that. From the time I was a high school kid, I was, if somebody asked me what I was going to do, I said, God has called me to do mission. When I went to college, I studied anthropology, cultural anthropology. Why? For cross cultural communication. Why? Because God called me to be a missionary. I didn't want to do anything else. Uh, I don't know, I, I didn't think about doing anything else. It wasn't even a matter of wanting to. I didn't really want to be a missionary either. I don't get me wrong. It wasn't like, oh God, I want you to call me to be a missionary. That wasn't it at all. It wasn't like I had a desire. It wasn't like I felt in any way qualified because I, I didn't, still don't. But even though it wasn't my choice, even though I was the most <coughs> unlikely person on the planet, I think, that God would call to be a missionary. God called me. And God has a call for you. And your call is probably not going to be the same as mine. I was, I was studying about the calls. And uh, really, for the last few weeks, I was thinking about this. And I thought, well, I'll go back and I'll study what, 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 how God called some of the, the great men and women of the Bible. And I went back and just to see what they had in common. I studied the, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors. I studied six prophets and one other that I'm going to go into, and you're going to find, well, that's kind of an unlikely person to talk about for God's call. But I wanted to see, well, how does God call, and how do people respond, and how, how it, does this, this uh, very strange and miraculous thing happen to be called in the ministry? So if you'll go with me, we'll take a little journey, and we're going to look very briefly at, at six prophets. Six prophets. And uh, we're not going to read the passages. These are things that many of you will be familiar with then. And if not, I'm going to tell a little bit about the story. And I'm going to start with Gideon. You find this story in Judges chapter 6. Gideon, one of the judges, called of God. And uh, the, the story says that the angel, he was called by an angel. I confess, I wasn't called by an angel. An angel appeared to Gideon. And he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Which I find a little bit ironic, <laughs> since Gideon was on the threshing floor hiding from the enemy, hiding from the Midianites. But the angel called him a mighty man of valor. He said, mm -hmm. are you so sure? And, and Gideon actually, and when you read the story, he tried to talk the angel out of calling him. He, he basically said, hey, you got it all wrong. To the angel. He said, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. In other words, you've got to find somebody more important than me if you want to find somebody capable of actually rescuing your people from the Midianites. But the angel still called Gideon, and Gideon, being very reluctant, he asked for a sign. Not just one sign, he asked for several signs, over and over. He had to be convinced. First sign was fire, and you know the story about the fleeces. The, the dry fleece on the wet ground and the wet fleece on the dry ground. Midian was trying to find any excuse. But eventually, eventually, he said, okay. And God used him in a mighty way to deliver Israel. 
Let's look at another prophet, the prophet Jeremiah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah is well known. He's the one that wrote Lamentations. Maybe not the most positive guy in the Bible. But in Jeremiah chapter 1 is the call of Jeremiah. And it says that he heard the word of the Lord. It wasn't an angel. But he, heard, he heard God speaking to him. And it doesn't explain if it was an audible voice or if it was an inner voice. Uh, maybe it was an inner voice. That's how God speaks to me, an inner voice. And, and it, but the word of the Lord said, Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. I set you apart as a prophet to the nations before he was even born. It wasn't like Gideon showed up and, and proved himself worthy or he got his, his merit badges or something. No, Gideon, I mean, uh, Jeremiah, before he was even born, God had him picked out, had him singled out. But as Jeremiah objected, again, he says, I'm only a child. I don't know how to speak. He said, God, you've got the wrong but then God spoke to him in his heart and said, Do not say I'm only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to. Do not be afraid. I am with you. And I will rescue you. So God promises to rescue him. Is that, if, you, if, if you're going in for a, a job interview and somebody says, Don't worry. When it gets really hot, I'll rescue you. <laughs> Who's going to take a job where you need to be rescued? But... Jeremiah received the call. He objected, but he ended up going. He wasn't always happy about it, but he ended up obeying God. So then let's look at Moses. This is prophet number three, Moses. We know the story. God, how, how, how there's a burning bush in the wilderness. And uh, Moses saw it, looked very curious. He kept walking in the bush, kept burning, kept walking. And he, so he drew close to it. And God's voice came out. I believe this was an audible voice. Came out and said, Moses, this is holy ground. I am sending you to bring my people Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And that started another argument. Immediately Moses says, who am I? I'm slow of speech. He even says, and you'll read it, it's in the account in Exodus, uh, I believe it's 31, he said, please send someone else. Please with God. Please send someone else. And even made God angry. And you may know the story how God said, okay, I'll give you Aaron, your brother-in-law. <clears throat> and Aaron will help you with this ministry. But he said, I've called you. He's basically saying, I'm not going to go before Pharaoh. He'd been in Pharaoh's palace. He may have also been thinking about the fact that he was a murderer. How about that? What kind of qualification is that to become God's prophet? But what did he do? He obeyed. You see a pattern here? Mm -hmm. You see a pattern? Let's look at one, a couple more. Let's look at the Apostle Paul. You know, remember he started out? He was Saul. Before God changed his name to Paul. And he was actually an enemy of the faith. He was persecuting Christians. He was having Christians killed. And then he was on the Damascus Road. You know the story how a great light shone round about him. He was blinded. And how God sent Ananias to talk to him and he explained how much he should suffer for God's name. <laughs> this is also kind of a repeating thing. God did not say, Paul, I'm calling you and you're going to have a picnic. It's just like going to Bahamas for vacation. You're going to have a great time. No, he says, you're going to suffer. And Paul said, I'm unworthy. And he says, I, I, I would persecute you. I, I can't be a, an apostle. He says, he, Paul calls himself one born out of season. He talks about his weakness. He says, he, he says to God, God said to Paul, to convince him, God said, my power is made perfect in your weakness. Was he looking for somebody strong so that they could go, ooh, ah? No, God was looking for a vessel that was willing. That's all that mattered. 
Paul says, I was the weakest of all. He said, later on in Romans 7, he says, Paul says, describes himself like this. He says, what a wretched man that I am. When I try to do right, I do wrong. But then he affirms that it's God's power that makes a difference. It's Paul that says, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul felt unworthy. But he wasn't afraid when God... But you see what, what God did to get his attention? Blinded. Mm -hmm. And he was only called when his, when his sight was restored. In 1 Corinthians, there's a, Paul makes an observation that I think we need to remember. When he says, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of noble birth. But God chose the lowly things of this world to nullify the world that no one may boast of. So those that God calls. We're not necessarily the best and the brightest. That's not our qualification. What is our qualification? It's God's choice. And it's God's power that performs the ministry. Whatever you're facing today, recognize that God knows who we are. Absolutely. But He's not glorified in our strength. He's not glorified in our, our natural ability or our looks or education or whatever you might say. God is glorified because He takes a humble thing in this world mm -hmm. and confounds this world with it. Uh, let me just make a comment here because here in America, I think we have a, a bad habit. We have a bad habit of worshiping celebrities. Celebrity worship. The big name, the athlete, the politician, the, the movie star, the singer, the artist. Who are your heroes today? I, I think it's a mistake when Somebody that's, whose name is in the news a lot. And then we heard, oh, that person's a Christian. We start talking to a lot of buzz. This person, like Kanye West. Okay. Kanye West. Okay. Uh, he gathered crowds and things. But is Kanye West, is, is he really who we need to, to pick as our role model? Or is somebody to, to uh, ad, adulate, adulate? Like actors. Uh, I wrote down a few names here. Kelsey Grammer. Some of you saw Jesus Revolution. After, after that movie came out, a lot of people were talking about, Kelsey Graham, a wonderful Christian. Well, I'm glad he's a Christian. He, he talks on TV like he's a Christian. But I know he's had a lot of personal problems, personal issues. And I hope God helps him with all of them. But is he the person that I want for role model or somebody like Billy Baldwin? Athletes like Deion Sanders, Tim Tebow, Kurt Warner. Okay, some of these people are Christians. Uh, my daughter used to... I live in St. Louis. Kurt Warner used to sit in front of her in church. Kurt Warner, the quarterback for the St. Louis Rams, you know, for his show on turf. It was a, it was a big deal back then. He's a, he's a fine Christian. But who should we choose to, to look up to as Christians? How about the people that we know? How about the people we know in their lives? How about the people we go to church with? How about our pastor? How about our, our deacons and elders? How about our brothers and sisters in Christ? Amen. Pattern your life after these kinds of people. Their name may not be in the headlines, headlines, and, and they may not be on, on the Hollywood tabloids, but that's the kind of people that God wants us to, to emulate. Okay, I got two more prophets, or maybe three. The next prophet may surprise you. Mary, the mother of Christ. Mm -hmm. She was a prophet. I mention her because there are women prophets in the Bible. They're not featured prominently, but there are. If you, if you look, there are more than a dozen. It's an interesting study. More than a dozen prophetesses in the Bible. And you know, in the Assemblies of God, we recognize that, that the women are gifted in ministry, that women are called in ministry. And we have ministers, uh, women pastors, missionaries. And I can tell you this, every pastor's wife is a missionary. 
in a pastor or so. So women are, are also called people. And when uh, Mary was visited by an angel, their angel visitation, <clears throat> Mary was troubled. She was afraid. Angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And even though Mary was troubled, she said, may it be to me as you have said. She was obedient. <coughs> and a little bit later on in Scripture, you'll see the beautiful prophetic song of Mary. The, the song of Mary. It's a prophetic song. She was afraid, but she was obedient. And she gave God praise. Mary was a called person. And, uh, I think her role was exceptionally difficult. And uh, you may be a little bit surprised about this person that I'm going to consider to be a called person. But in Jesus, as Jesus was going around ministering, there was a rich young ruler that came in <coughs> and had a conversation with Jesus. He was there. Jesus was performing miracles, healing people. Wonderful things were happening. And he said, uh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the story. Jesus said, oh, only God is good. Mm -hmm. Then they had the discussion about how you get into heaven. And Jesus said, well, you've got to obey all the, the laws. He said, this I've done from my childhood. So he was qualified. I'm saying that in an ironic way. <laughs> he thought he was qualified, right? He was a rich young ruler, probably esteemed. He was, had a lot of status among his people. Mm -hmm. What did Jesus say? He said, okay, you want eternal life? Go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Come follow me. The Bible says that he went away sad because he had many possessions. Think about the call that he had. He didn't have an angel. He didn't have a voice. He didn't have a burning bush. He had the King of kings and the Lord of lords Amen. look into his eyes and say, follow me. The miracle worker was right there. Jesus had his attention. Jesus gave him a personal invitation. No telling what God might have, have used that young man to do. I mean, we'll never know because he said no. He said no. He missed an opportunity, an amazing opportunity. And he disappears off into history, off into anonymity. Probably had a nice life. He had a lot of money. But he refused the call of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So we're going to see one more prophet. We're going to look at Isaiah. Mm. And this is going to be my text and, and my, the, the last prophet and, and how we're going to wrap up this morning. Mm -hmm. The prophet Isaiah. And we're going to look in Isaiah chapter 6. And if you'd like to turn to it, it's, it's worthwhile turning. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, 1 through 8. We're just going to read those eight verses. And we're going to look at Isaiah's call a little bit more carefully. And this passage, friends, this is a passage God used to work in my life for many months. I'd say it was one of my key passages, my, my key scriptures that God has used with me. I remember when I was back at the University of Kansas, I was a senior in Kansas. And, <clears throat> and as God was working in my life, calling me, you know when God calls you, He doesn't usually just call you once. He usually just calls you over and over and over. Oh. So this is one of those times when God was calling. And this scripture was on my heart. It was heavy. I was just living with it. I was living with it. And uh, let's look at the elements. Isaiah chapter 6. We'll just read the, the verses. <clears throat> Isaiah 6 says, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. He had a vision of God. God gave him a vision. Now, we know that you can't see the Lord, really see God and live. So we know what he saw was a vision, but he says, I saw the Lord. 
That would get your attention. I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were the seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah was shaken to his very core to see what appeared to be the throne room of God, the most strange and unusual sight that you could possibly imagine. And it was shaking, and there was thunder and lightning. There were these strange beings flying around. And then they were saying, holy, holy, holy. What does that mean, holy, holy, holy? Friends, in America, we have a hard time with holy, holy, holy. We tend to be a very irreverent people. We tend to, to, to make fun of things, sometimes sacrilege. But that was not the feeling of Isaiah when he was seeing the throne room of God, seeing the doorposts being shaken, seeing these creatures here in holy, holy, holy. God is a holy God. And when he saw the holy God, says it was God revealing himself. God does that to each of us in his own way. He reveals himself to us. We can't see him, we can't know him, we can't reach out and figure him out. But God's will is that each of us have a, a personal revelation of God, who he is. And this was Isaiah's personal revelation. And when he saw the holy God, then he saw himself. And he recognized, I'm not worthy to be in this place. He said, I'm a sinner. I have unclean lips. My people have unclean lips. Saying, God, I'm unworthy. God, why are you allowing me to see all this? I'm undone. He, he, he thought he was going to die. Then, then one of the beings came and touched his lips with a coal from the altar. Purified his, his lips. Also purified his heart. Changed him. <coughs> purified him. Made him righteous in God's sight. Where he could be in God's presence. He said, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. So the first thing that happened was he had a change. He was redeemed by the presence of God, by these creatures. And then when God said, who will we sin? His response was, here am I. Send me. At that moment, there was nothing more important to him. The world had faded into nothing. He was looking at, at the Lord God of hosts. And at that moment, nothing was more important than saying, God, what can I do to please you? Whatever else this world holds, it can't hold a candle to you. There's nothing important. Only what you want, God, Lord. Here am I. Send me. So let's see what we, what, what are the commonalities in these six calls that we mentioned study today. First thing is none of them had it. It was, it was not their own idea. To be called. They weren't seeking to be called. They didn't want to be called. God singled them out and chose them. The second thing, each time the person that God was calling felt unworthy, unqualified, too weak, too full of flaws, too full of failures, too full of sin on their own. But the third thing we find in common is that there was something majestic, something holy, something supernatural, something powerful in the call of God. Something overwhelming 
God's power. And because of that, even though they said, choose somebody else, or I'm a child, or I have unclean lips, they said, okay, I obey. I'll do what you want me to do. And in each case, God used them mightily. And they've changed the world. The kingdom has been expanded. The kingdom has grown. The kingdom has gone forward because they were obedient. God, each, God used each one in a mighty way, but it wasn't because... They were good at something. It wasn't because they deserved to be called. It wasn't because they had this special ability. It was because they were willing to, to surrender and say, okay, God, it's not my will, but your will. It's not my power, but it's your power. And God said, okay, I'm going to use them. And my power is going to be demonstrated, and I'll be glorified. God is calling us today, friends. There's a call in our lives. Let me just share just a little bit of my own testimony. It's like most. Because like most of these people here, there's no way that I felt like I was worthy or capable or that there was any even possibility that I could be used by God, that I could be a servant. And even though, as a very young person, <clears throat> I had a sensitivity to God. I had a sensitivity to God's presence. In our church, when, when the evangelists would come, would give a, an altar call, would give an invitation to come forward, I was usually the first one there. I responded many times. I had a tender heart. And even though uh, there was nothing particularly attractive, you know, I had my... I had my heroes, but they weren't my pastors. They weren't. It wasn't like I wanted to be a Christian, the greatest Christian ever. But I did want to please God. And as I got a little older, especially when I got in high school, I had a time in my life where it was more difficult for me to please God. You know, a little young kid, not so tough. Junior high, more tough. Mm -hmm. High school, I played on the football team. I was a, a lineman. I had buddies on the football team. And we liked to go out together. We, we didn't do anything too outlandish, but, you know, I was using the bad language along with them. We're telling off-color stories. I, I was having difficulty with, with uh, impure thoughts and all. And then I'd come to church because... My parents were church-going people, believe me. I was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I was there. And every time I was in church, it was a struggle because I would, I would see myself. I would see what the preacher is saying. I, was, I would see that I wasn't measuring up. I, would, I, was, I could see that I wasn't pleasing God and I wasn't then pleasing myself. I wasn't pleasing anybody, to be honest with you. I wasn't pleasing God, I wasn't pleasing myself. And I began a, a, a struggle, a battle. It's kind of like I got on a merry-go-round of where I would, I would say, God, I'm, I'm sorry for my sins. I don't want to do that anymore. And then I get back at school, get with my friends, and get back into the same old rut, same old habit. And over and over, I, I would have this, this struggle going on inside me. And I thought, man, I'm such a hippie. Uh, man, it's not working for me. I had a big youth group. We had a lot of, a lot of kids, and, and some of them seemed to be very successful Christians. They seemed to be living for God. They seemed to be pleasing God with their lives. And I thought, well, why can't I be like that? Why do I keep failing God? And I finally came to the uh, conclusion. Now, I, I don't think I came to this conclusion all by myself. Because the Bible talks about how we have an enemy. Mm -hmm. That enemy, one of his names is the accuser of the brethren. That's right. Brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And he was doing a number on me. He was doing a number on my head. And I became convinced that while other people could live the Christian life in a successful way, that I just didn't have what it takes. 
to be a Christian. In fact, I, I came to the place where I said, man, I give up. That is a lie from the enemy. I said, man, I give up. I can't do it. Actually, it's part lie, part truth. Because the truth is, I can't do it. I stand before you today. I still can't do it. Okay? I can't do it. In my own strength. No way, it's not happening. But as a young Christian, as a young person, I struggled with that. And, and I got to the point where I said, God, just leave me alone. I'd go to church and I'd kind of put my fingers in my ears and pretend that, that the preacher wasn't talking. I'd pretend that I didn't feel the Holy Spirit. And I remember I got the opportunity, I, I, uh, I got my life-saving certificate because I wanted to be a, uh, a lifeguard at church camp. So I thought, oh, I'm going to I'm gonna have a good summer. You like it. But about the third day of camp, the camp director came by and said, uh, I don't think I saw you in church last night. He said, I think I better see you in church tonight. Or you're not going to be the lifeguard anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I was at church then. And when the word was preached, the Holy Spirit's power fell on that group. It fell on me. And I'm standing there saying, uh-uh. You know me, God. This is me, you know. <laughs> I've already proved that I don't have what it takes. I can't do it. I, when the altar call, the invitation was given, I, I did go forward. And I knelt down at the front of the church. And I, I, I said, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to make a fool out of myself again. I'm not going to one more time make a promise and then break it the next day. I'm done with that. And I got up from the altar and just went out the side door. Had some alone time. I went down by the, the swimming area because I was like, I could put in. And I was having a battle. Battle with God, battle with myself. I seem to be losing the battle. <laughs> yeah. And after everybody else had already gone back to the, the bunk houses, I kind of snuck in where the camp workers were, and I, I laid down and put my head up on the ledge. Didn't have any walls, just had some screens. Out there in the middle of nowhere, like the Ozarks in the country. And I looked up, and it was so dark, and the stars were so bright. The zillion bright points of light up there, I said, God, you're all that really matters in this world. Your program is it. You're the eternal God. You made everything. Nothing happens that's important except that it, if, it, if it happens in accordance with you and your plan and your kingdom. I said, I'd like to be part of that. It's not good enough. And then something came over me that hadn't come over me in a long time. As I felt God's love. I was surprised. I thought, man, I've already, I've already burned that bridge. But I felt God's love. And I felt God saying, you tried it in your own strength. But if you tried it in my strength, you tried to, to be good. Okay, you've proven that you don't have what it takes to walk for me in your own strength. But he said, now, I want you to depend on me. And I want you to give me a chance, and I want you to give my power a chance. And something melted inside me. I mean, I've been cold. I've been hard. You know, when you reject God over and over again, something happens to you. It's a dangerous place to be. The Bible talks about how your conscience becomes seared as with a, a hot iron. You're, you're, you, you, you get insensitive to God. And that's where I was, but God broke through that. And I laid there with my head up on the, the sill, and it was fierce, filled my eyes, ran down into my ears. God, what's happening? He said, give me another chance. Only this time, do it my way, not your way. Your way is never going to work. And I learned something that night. 
It was just the beginning. I, that, that was my adult moment. You know, we all have to have a face-to-face -face with God when we're of an age of responsibility and say, okay, God, it's your plan. I surrender. I'm going to go with you. I'm going to do it your way. And I found out that God's keeping power is just as great as his saving power. If he can save you, he can keep you. He's got the power to keep you right there. But you need to learn to live a life of repentance. That's what I didn't understand. I didn't understand that every time I, I made a mistake didn't mean that, that, that uh, I was cast into outer darkness again. It just meant that I needed to find my way back to, to face to face with God and say, God, I'm sorry. Help me. God, help me because I learned that God does help me. The Bible talks about how from glory to glory, He does transform us. But it doesn't happen overnight. And it doesn't just happen. And for good, and, and you never have to go back. Because a, a life of repentance means every day saying, search me, O oh God. Amen. Every day saying, God, yesterday I seemed to have fallen short, but today make me strong. Because God will do that. He will come through for you. And if you had a, the thing that I've gone through what I went through, and if the enemy is beating you up, don't listen to it. But listen to a loving God who died for you, who shed his blood for you, who died so he could forgive you, yeah. over and over if that's what it takes. Yeah. And we have to learn the lesson, we have to learn what it means to learn how to walk a life of repentance. Amen. <coughs> What is God calling you to do? I listed three kinds of calls as we close today. Three kinds of calls. These calls are for everybody. <clears throat> and the first call is to call to himself. God is calling. He's saying, come to me. Come to me, bring your burdens, bring your sins, bring your cares, bring your worries, bring your needs. Because I'm here for you. I'm here to forgive you. I'm here to become your savior. I'm here to become, excuse me, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I'm here to fill your life with my presence. Call me. If you haven't answered that call today, you need to do that. You need to do that now. While I'm talking, just bow your head and say, God, come in. The second call God calls every believer to a position of submission, position of surrender. Some call it sanctification. Some call it holiness. It's, a, it's where you, you've said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to renounce the world, God. From now on, I'm going to live for you. It's a call where, where you get over that battle. You don't have to fight that battle over and over again like I did. Just say, okay, once and for all, okay, God, fight that battle for me. The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let Him fill you with His Spirit. Let Him fill you with His presence. I remember when I was a young person, a preacher gave a very simplistic illustration. He said, just imagine that you're this nickel. You got a nickel. He said, just imagine you're this nickel. And you say to God, here's my life. This, this nickel is my life. God, spend it however you want. Have you done that with God? I, I prayed that simple prayer. God heard it. You say, well, I'm not a nickel, I'm a diamond. Okay? <laughs> Give him the diamond. Say, God, take me. Do what you will with me. Submit to God. Because He'll use you. He'll fill your life with, with challenges. If your life boring, give it to God. He'll make it much more interesting. And then the other thing is, the third call is a call to service. And God calls us to service. He calls all of us to service. Not the same service, different services. I don't know, I may be the only person that was called to be a missionary in Africa. You may be, oh, I don't want to spread that prayer. Maybe God will call me to be a missionary. Whatever God calls you to, he'll call you to something that, that, that's just for you. Mm -hmm. 
just for you. He would just say, use me, God. You say, well, I don't have the ability. Well, the main ability that God is looking for is availability. Amen. Say, God, use me. You don't know what to do? Uh, see the pastor. The pastor will help you find ways where you can be of service, where you can grow in service. Start with a job. Do that well. It, and, and, and God will promote you to another job. Uh, I know uh, uh, when I was a youth pastor, we had a coach. He said, God called me to be a coach. Well, God bless him. God did call him to be coach. I, I met a farmer once. He said, I love farming. I feel like that's what God's will is for me. I want to be a farmer. And I feel that God is pleased, okay? Whatever God calls you to be a teacher, to be a Sunday school teacher, to find a place in the church, where you can be used. Maybe he'll call you to be a missionary. Maybe he'll call you to, to be a pastor. My wife has a special call in her life. She's been a call to be a caregiver to him. It's a special thing. Maybe you're, God's calling you to be a friend. Maybe God's calling you to, to, uh, to care about somebody that really needs somebody to care about. Think about it for a moment. Is there somebody that you know that needs somebody to care for them? That may be God's voice saying, this is you. God is just saying, call, I want you to go. And waiting to hear, you say, here am I, send me. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice today. I'm going to close with this illustration about a minister's meeting, like we go to. And Everett Phillips was the speaker. He was the Africa secretary for about 20 years, in charge of all the missionaries in Africa. <clears throat> and they were asking him to talk a little bit about what he saw in the mission field in Africa when he was a missionary in Nigeria. And so he, he was telling about the story, and he mentioned something that he didn't usually mention. He said, I, I saw a strange thing in, in, in one region in Nigeria. It was the Calabar region in Nigeria. And he said, I was surprised because there was a spontaneous revival, a move of God that happened in a certain area, but there was no missionary around. And we didn't even find out about it until later. Many people got saved and there was a lot of enthusiasm. But in the Calabar region, it seems that they fell into error, doctrinal error. And the whole revival got off track. And he says, I've been curious about that all these years. And as he was closing the meeting, there was a pastor, a minister that was in that meeting. And he could see his shoulders were shaking. He was sobbing. He was bawling. He was crying out. So after they prayed, closed the meeting, he went over to this brother and said, Brother, can I help you? Can I pray for you? Well, what's your need? He said, Well, you know, I'm a pastor. I said, about 20 years ago, as I was praying, I heard the word in my, in my mind. I heard this word caliber in my mind. And I, I was impressed that it meant something special, caliber. I never heard that word in my life. He said, I looked it up. Found out it was this region in Nigeria. I kept praying about it, and I felt that God was encouraging me. He said, I, I thought God was calling me to go to Calabar to be a missionary. He said, but you know, I shared it with my wife, I shared it with the, the, the women of the church, some of the leaders, some of the deacons and elders, and I said, really? It's Calibo? Are you sure? What is this Calibo? Are you sure you're here? You're having a wonderful ministry right here. You're our pastor. We love you. And it seemed that the call just sort of faded. Basically, the people around him had talked him out. Here it was 20 years later. He saw the opportunity that he, he had missed to direct a, a movement of God in a region in Nigeria. He had regrets. Friends, the call of God is precious.